At Discount Tire, we know your time is valuable. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online. Did you know Discount Tire now sells wiper blades? Check out our current deals at DiscountTire.com or stop in and talk to an associate today. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. This spring, transform your outdoor space into a regular gathering place for you and your loved ones with help from Ashley. Whether you're into wicker, teak, or driftwood-inspired furniture, we've got the look you're going for. Add in accessories like string lights and beverage tubs to take your patio party from basic to curated and enjoy cozy evening vibes with a new fire pit. Visit Ashley.com or stop by your local store and find affordable pricing and expert support today. Shop and save today, only at Ashley. News, Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, April 14th, 2023. Today, the Department of Justice has arrested a 21-year-old Air National Guardsman for being part of the leaked national security documents. John Ratcliffe and Rick Grinnell testified in two different cases on Capitol Hill today. I have an update on the Mifepreston suit. ProPublica unearthed a real estate deal between Clarence Thomas and the Nazi collector Harlan Crow. E. Jean Carroll's lawsuit clears another hurdle. And Trump draws an Obama judge in his lawsuit against Michael Cohen, who has already had enough of his shit. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everyone. Happy Friday. Don't forget, today at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, we have a happy hour Zoom call meet and greet for patrons of this show. If you're a patron, you can look for that link in your email. Look forward to seeing you and answering your questions. Lots of court news today. Trump drew Judge Gales an Obama appointee in the half a billion dollar Cohen lawsuit. And he's issued his first minute order in the case, telling Joey Tacos, that's Tacopina, that if he doesn't use Times New Roman 12 point font in his filings per court docket rules, he could impose a sanction on him that could include tossing the entire lawsuit. So off to a great start there. Uh, Grinnell and Ratcliffe testified today. They were both spotted going into different D.C. grand juries. Think about that. Two former directors of national intelligence testified today in two separate federal grand jury investigations into the former president for espionage and an attempted coup. Just like sit with that sentence for a minute. (laughs) We have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. From Ruth Marcus at The Washington Post. She says, don't be confused by the headlines that a federal appeals court has allowed the abortion drug, Mifepristone, to remain available. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit's action is a defeat for the rule of law, for scientific expertise, and for reproductive health. The bottom line, if the order stands, and I am hopeful that the Supreme Court will intervene, is that mifepristone will be available only through seven weeks of pregnancy, not the 10 weeks that the FDA has said is safe and effective. Women won't be able to obtain the medication through the mail, and it will only be able to get it after in-person office visits, not one, but three only physicians will be allowed to dispense it. This is judicial activism cloaked in compromised clothing, courtesy of two Trump-appointed judges, Kurt Engelhart and Andrew Oldham. A third judge, a George W. Bush appointee, Katharina Hayes, would have kicked that can down the road. It looks law-like, only by comparison with the shoddy work of the U.S. District Judge Matthew Kaczmarek. That's the, uh, that's the Texas judge who blocked the use of um, mifeprestone. To understand the radicalism of this move, keep in mind the posture of the case. The question before the appellate court wasn't about who was right or wrong. That'll be decided down the road after a full briefing and oral argument. Rather, the immediate issue is whether the court should halt Kazmarek's ruling from taking effect in the interim. As the opinion itself noted, we grant stays only in extraordinary circumstances, and then it proceeds to blow through nearly every ordinary barrier to upsetting the status quo. The chief issue on which the appellate court swatted down Kazmarek involved whether the anti-abortion doctors who brought the case could run the clock all the way back to 2000 when the FDA first approved it, Mifeprestone. The ordinary statute of limitations for challenging an agency action is six years, and the appellate court said the plaintiffs waited too long to complain about the 2000 action, although even that it noted it was a close call because perhaps the FDA reopened the issue when it eased the requirements for dispensing Mifepristone in 2016 and 2021, meaning maybe Mifepristone could get yanked off the market entirely when the case is finally decided, though that will be by a different appellate panel. 
The statute of limitations was about the only point on which the court got things right. It stretched the law to find that the doctor groups that challenged mefepristone had suffered enough of a harm, concrete and demonstrable injury, that they had standing to bring suit. Again, I told you there was no standing in this case, and it's unbelievable that the Fifth Circuit didn't you know, find that in its ruling. Note, this is supposed to be a strict test, so courts don't get dragged into matters that aren't their business. And note as well, these doctors don't even prescribe mifepristone. They claimed, without much in the way of proof, that simply having the drug on the market harmed them by forcing them to deal with the fallout from those who do administer the medication. As the Biden administration argued in its brief to the appellate court, under this lax approach to standing, quote, doctors could, for example, challenge the licensing of federal firearms dealers or allegedly inadequate highway safety standards on the theory that some individuals may be injured and seek treatment from the association's members. No matter, said the appeals court. So just to give you a taste of the contortions it engaged in to find standing here, the court accepted the claim that, quote, as a result of the FDA's failure to regulate this potent drug, these doctors have had to devote significant time and resources to caring for women experiencing mefepristone's harmful effects. Hello? In the 23 years that mefepristone has been on the market, emergency rooms have not been overrun with women suffering harms. The court added, a second independent injury from the adverse effects of mefepristone is the enormous stress and pressure physicians face in treating these women. Um, maybe if you find this stressful, don't become an ER doc. And, the court said, not only have these doctors suffered injuries in the past, but it's also inevitable that at least one doctor in one of these associations will face harm in the future, given how many women these doctors have seen in emergency departments in the past. These doctors quite reasonably know with statistical certainty that women will continue needing plaintiffs' emergency care. As it happens, there is a 2009 Supreme Court case that directly forecloses this, a case neither Kazmarek nor the appellate court bothered to cite. In this case, and the case that um, she's referencing here, Justice Scalia, joined by the four other conservative justices, declared that standing cannot be based on a past injury rather than an imminent future injury. Mere statistical probabilities, Scalia said, don't cut it. That's Scalia. The appellate court wasn't any more restrained when it tackled the merits, um, which it shouldn't even have to get to. There was no standing. The agency made mifepristone easier to obtain in 2016 and again easier to obtain in 2021, actions that the court said looked arbitrary and capricious, enough so to upset the status quo. The court didn't like the studies that the FDA experts relied on, but courts are supposed to defer to agency expertise and not second guess it. The Biden administration has said it will appeal that decision to the Supreme Court. And even this court, I am reasonably confident, cannot square its past rulings with this travesty of an opinion. Quote, DOJ strongly disagrees with the Fifth Circuit's decision in Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine v. the FDA to deny in part our request for a stay pending appeal. That's Merrick Garland in a statement who says we will be seeking emergency relief from the Supreme Court. And the DOJ should win this. We'll see. And from Ismay at the Times, among the many questions regarding how a junior enlisted airman may have been behind one of the largest leaks of top secret information since Edward Snowden is how a person in his position could have access to those documents. The FBI has arrested 21-year-old Jack Texiera, I think that's how you pronounce it, who's an Airman First Class in the Massachusetts Air National Guard, and he is accused of illegally sharing classified defense information. Air Force officials said that when he was trained as a cyber transport systems journeyman and was decorated with an Air Force Achievement Medal, which is awarded to junior officers for notable achievements, The service's career website says cyber transport system specialists are responsible for keeping the force's communication network running. This job requires that applicants complete what the military calls a single-scope background investigation, which is required before being granted top-secret security clearance. The unit Mr. Texiera is believed to be assigned to, the 102nd Intelligence Wing, is headquartered at Otis Air National Guard Base, which is on Joint Base Cape Cod in Eastern Mass. When a Times reporter called the executive offices of the wing, a person identifying himself as Colonel Gordon twice directed any questions to the Department of Justice or the FBI. On its official website, the wing lists its mission as providing worldwide precision intelligence and command and control, along with trained and experienced airmen for expeditionary combat support and homeland security. The wing commander's biography says he's responsible for 1,260 military and civilian personnel and their duties include responding to domestic emergencies in Massachusetts while also training for wartime missions. 
Those missions are given as intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance operations, cryptologic intelligence, cyber engineering and installation support, medical and expeditionary combat support. A unit at the Otis base also processes intelligence from U-2 spy planes, RQ-4 Global Hawk and MQ-4 Reaper drones, and provides support to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. That unit, the 102nd Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Group, is a subordinate unit of the 102nd Intelligence Wing. The 102nd Intelligence Wing publicly lists several job openings for airmen in signals, crypto, and geospatial intelligence. The state of Massachusetts has had a long history with the National Guard, which was founded in 1636, and that's according to an official website, which notes that the first Guard Aviation Unit in Massachusetts was authorized in 1921. After the 9-11 attacks, airmen of the Massachusetts Air National Guard have flown air patrols over the East Coast. They have long supported combat operations overseas as well. Massachusetts Air National Guard website says members can choose among 200 different career fields and will learn leadership skills that today's employers value. Quote, no matter what you're interested in, there's a good chance you'll find it here. So that is the background and where the guy worked um, who has been arrested for these leaks. Now, it's still unclear to me whether he is the mastermind of all this. Something tells me he's not, but he might be. Who knows? I think we'll learn more as the DOJ investigates. And of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying that because we arrested him, he's a patriot. And um, the Biden administration is, you know, awful. It's, um, I'm, I'm very worried about the Republicans' position on this. This guy leaked national security documents. High-level national security documents. And the Republicans are on his side. All right, next up from ProPublica. In 2014, one of Texas billionaire Harlan Crow's companies purchased a string of properties on a quiet residential street in Savannah, Georgia. It wasn't a marquee acquisition for the real estate magnate, just an old single-story home and two vacant lots down the road. What made it noteworthy were the people on the other side of the transaction, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and his relatives. The transaction marks the first known instance of money flowing from the Republican mega donor to Supreme Court Justice Thomas. The Crow Company bought the properties for about $133,000 from three co owners Clarence Thomas, his mom, and the family of Thomas's late brother. And that's according to a state tax document and a deed dated 2014 filed at the Chatham County Courthouse. The purchase put Crow in an unusual position. He now owned the house where Clarence Thomas's elderly mother was living. Soon after the sale was complete, Contractors began work on tens of thousands of dollars in improvements on the two-bedroom, one-bath home, which looks out on a patch of orange trees. The renovations included a carport, a repaired roof, a new fence, and some gates. A federal disclosure law passed after Watergate requires Thomas and other officials to disclose the details of most real estate sales over $1,000. Thomas never disclosed this sale. That appears to be a violation of the law, according to four ethics law experts who spoke to ProPublica. The disclosure form... Thomas filed for that year, also has a space to report the identity of the buyer in any private transaction, such as a real estate deal, and that space was left blank. Quote, he needed to report his interest in the sale. That's what Virginia Cantor, a former government ethics lawyer, now watchdog with Crew, said. Given the role Crow played in subsidizing the lifestyle of Thomas and his wife, you have to wonder if this was an effort to put cash in their pockets. Thomas didn't respond to detailed questions. In a statement, Crow said he purchased Thomas's mother's house where Thomas spent part of his childhood to preserve it. My intention is to one day create a public museum at the Thomas home dedicated to telling the story of our nation's second black Supreme Court justice. I approached the Thomas family about my desire to maintain his, this historic site for future generations so they could learn about the inspiring life of one of our greatest Americans. Crow's statement did not directly address why he also bought two vacant lots from Thomas down the street, but he wrote that the other lots were later sold to a vetted builder who was committed to improving the quality of the neighborhood and preserving its historical integrity. ProPublica asked Crow about the additions on Thomas's mother's house. Improvements were also made to the Thomas property to preserve its long-term viability and accessibility to the public, he said. Ethics law experts said Crow's intentions had no bearing on Thomas's legal obligation to disclose the sale. Now, this is more about just not disclosing. The Judge Thomas went out of his way to hide this transaction, screams that it's probably corrupt. It's a bribe on its face. All right, next up from Law and Crime, E. Jean Carroll's first defamation case against the former guy survived 
on Thursday after a D.C.-based appellate court declined to resolve the question of his immunity. In 2019, Trump told reporters that Carol wasn't his type when he was asked about accusations that he raped her. And uh, Carol sued Trump shortly after that. And Trump claimed that he was absolutely immune from that lawsuit as then a sitting president. That position instigated a protracted legal battle. Trump lost at the trial court level before securing a partial victory on appeal. The Second Circuit found Trump was an employee of the government, but the appellate court punted on a separate question to the D.C. Court of Appeals. So they said, what do you guys think? And that question is whether Trump acted in his official capacity when he allegedly defamed E. Jean Carroll. And on Thursday, an eight-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals would not provide a firm resolution. Quote, under the law of D.C. and on the record before us, whether the president of the United States was acting within the scope of his employment is a question for the fact finder, they wrote in a 52-page opinion. Carroll's attorney, Roberta Kaplan, declined to comment. The ruling should not affect the date of the upcoming trial on April 25th, which has been slated for Carol's separate lawsuit. That's Carol 2. That's the one that she filed under New York's Adult Survivors Act. A separate count in that case alleges Trump defamed Carol in a post on Truth Social well after the end of his presidency. Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, asserted that the appellate court gave the former president a roadmap to defeat the first lawsuit. Now that the D.C. Court of Appeals has clarified the certified question before it, we are confident that the Second Circuit will rule in Trump's favor and dismiss Carol's case in its entirety. Former federal prosecutor Mitchell Epner said in an interview that the court's decision defies tidy classification about who emerged the winner. Quote, Trump thought he was going to get a victory. Instead, both sides live to fight another day. That's what he said. This case at issue, again, has been designated Carol 1. And regardless of its resolution, Carol 2 will head to a grand jury on April 25th. Trump tried to delay it again, saying that the news from his indictment needed a cooling off period so that it wouldn't taint potential jurors. And of course, that lawsuit, um, well, actually breaking news right now, the court has ruled that the suit, well, Kaplan, Judge Kaplan has ruled that the suit will start, the the case will start on April 25th, but said that Trump can depose E. Jean one more time before, before the trial starts. So the trial ain't moving. All right, that is the news. Lots of, lots of court stuff. Um, and it's not all great news. And uh, so we do need some good news today. And we'll have that right after this break. If you have any good news you want to send us, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. When it comes to buying your first home, everyone has questions. Can we even afford to buy a house right now? Well, I need to negotiate. How do I even negotiate? Luckily, a REMAX agent has answers. Hey, Brian, those are really good questions. They are? Thanks. It's my first time buying. I work with first-time buyers all the time. I got you. Remax agents have more experience than other real estate agents. Visit Remax.com or download the Remax app to find the right agent. The right agent can lead the way. Each office independently owned and operated. At Discount Tire, we know your time is valuable. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online. Did you know Discount Tire now sells wiper blades? Check out our current deals at DiscountTire.com or stop in and talk to an associate today. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. This spring, transform your outdoor space into a regular gathering place for you and your loved ones with help from Ashley. Whether you're into wicker, teak, or driftwood-inspired furniture, we've got the look you're going for. Add in accessories like string lights and beverage tubs to take your patio party from basic to curated and enjoy cozy evening vibes with a new fire pit. Visit Ashley.com or stop by your local store and find affordable pricing and expert support today. Shop and save today, only at Ashley. These days, I do all my shopping online. Clothes, books, outfits for my dog. I love it. Then I thought, why not get my groceries delivered too? So I downloaded the Instacart app and sure enough, it has all my favorite stores. Macy's, Lynn's, Fresh Market, Dan's, Dick's. Everything I need delivered right to my door. Oh, the dog treats are here. (laughs) Download the Instacart app or visit instacart.com to get free delivery on your first order. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good 
good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, a shout out to a local business in your area, something you're creating, your business, if you're a maker or a creator, shout out to somebody that you love, shit kids say, shit adults say, shit you've said, <laughs> play what the mutt with me, send pictures of frog orgies, whatever you'd like to do, the tape on the floor with the cats, uh, anything you can send it to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact from Lola Gale, pronouns she and her. Self-care submission. When I'm feeling stressed out and overloaded by all the news, I like to go into my studio to paint. I paint in many styles, abstract, caricature, etc. But what really de-stresses me the best is dots, dots, and lots of dots. All the damn dots. I go in there, turn on some retro rock, and dot my stress away. Here's one I've been working on for a week or two. Still a bajillion more dots to go. Once these are finished, they usually go to a new home where the new owner can run their hands over them whenever walking by, which is also kind of de-stressing, to be honest. Also, sharing a pic of the view outside my studio window. Texas is so lovely in the spring, and I hope you enjoy. And we've all seen Lola Gale's paintings. They're absolutely incredible. Make sure you follow her on social media. You can see all of her work. Oh, it is a beautiful day in Texas in spring. Thank you so much for that submission. Next up, from Anonymous, pronouns she and her. Love the show. Here's how I cope when it gets to be too much. I'm lucky that I'm a director of community services for the intellectually disabled So I get a lot of good news from my work, but sometimes I need a boost and I'll go back and read that last paragraph of George Eliot's Middlemarch. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owning to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Hmm. Small things matter. And the more small things that are done and the more people that do them, the better off we all will be. Also, dogs in baseball jerseys. (laughs) Go Phillies. (laughs) Look at these babies in their jerseys. Oh, so adorable. Thank you for sending those. Up next up, Chris in Portland. She or her. Hello, Beans crew. My cats are longtime box fiends, so I knew for sure they'd fall prey to the cat trap. But alas, they are too clever to fall for these inadequate boxes. I even tested one myself to be sure they were fully functional. For now, Moose, Baba, and Tenet remain untrapped and unimpressed. And here's the picture. They are outside of these boxes. That was cute. Yeah, they're like, they're like walking around them, like not going, specifically not going in the boxes. That's hilarious. Thank you for that. Next up from Derek F. No pronouns. I put my foot down for no more dogs. My wife found this guy, and I couldn't stop looking at him. He looks like he was electrocuted, she would say. They think he's about 13, has epilepsy, and he's overweight. I thought no one would take him. The next day, I found myself driving to the Twin Cities one and a half hours to get him. Frank has been a wonderful pup for us. He's in the twilight, as he may be as old as 18 or 19, and not getting around as well as he used to. Good luck on what the mutt? Hint, Italian greyhound. Yep. What? No. Look at this baby. What a sweetheart. I mean, he looks like he's got poodle in there, but hmm, maybe a little corgi or something. I don't know. Let's see. We have miniature poodle. All right. Toy poodle. Okay. So the two smallest poodles. Visla. Okay. So what I thought might be a corgi is a visla because of that brown color and a large Munsterlander. Oh, okay. How'd he join the party? And terrier, short-haired dachshund, miniature wire-haired dachshund, Scottish terrier, short-haired dachshund, miniature long-haired dachshund, Portuguese Podengo Pequeno, and 1% Norfolk terrier. That's God loves the terrier. (laughs) Thank you so much. What a honey. And thank you for adopting an elderly pet. I love that. Next up from Michelle and Laura. Hi, Beans team. We're listeners from the kitchen table days. Hello. 2023 has not been our best, and it started with the loss of our beloved pirate lion Esteban after a battle with kidney disease. Oh, that's the worst. We've been so sad and not enjoying our quiet house, but confident the universe would send us our next kitty. And that's what the, the universe does that, right? The universe has a, a cat distribution system that's just always 100% right on. Uh, and so a couple of weeks ago, it delivered with this funny, adorable Persian rescue. His name is Jack. So we had to enhance it. Meet special counsel Jack Smith. (laughs) He's definitely on the case. And okay, I've seen pictures of this cat. 
uh, on social media. Absolutely amazing. Little lion cut, floofy tail. And he's got like a Matt Gates forehead. I swear to God, he's got the forehead, like a super tall forehead. He looks like the, you know, Mystery Science Theater 3000, This Island Earth aliens, you know, with the helmets, Brack <laughs> and Exeter, <laughs> who use um, the Interocitor. If you haven't seen Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, what are you even doing? You have to go see it. You must. That's that's your homework um, to, to de-stress and unwind. I, I started watching Succession. Holy shit. Everybody in that family is just a piece of garbage <laughs> like trying to find the nice people. Uh, there really aren't any. Uh, although the Calkin brother is pretty, pretty funny, uh, at least entertaining. Anyway, uh, that's what I'm doing right now to de-stress. And I went and saw They Might Be Giants last night. Got to meet one of my heroes again, John Flansburg. And, you know, they do the music for this show. And they're truly, truly amazing in concert. They're on tour. If you have a chance to go see them, I highly recommend it. All right. That is the good news. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Uh, we'll be, you know, we've got the uh, the Beans uh, bonus episode for patrons this weekend. We have happy hour today at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern. I have the Clean Up on Aisle 45 bonus episode coming out this weekend for Clean Up on Aisle 45 patrons with me and Pete Strzok. And we have Jack, which will come out on Sunday. And there's a lot of special counsel news. Those investigations are, I mean, I I think when I texted Andy this weekend about some of the subpoenas that went out in the fraud case, you know, the super PAC looking for, you know, wire fraud, defrauding donors. And he said, man, it's that's there. He's just a subpoena factory. (laughs) It's true. And now he's got everybody coming in to testify. And we'll announce a contest winner for what we call the eight people that uh, have been ordered to testify, um, you know, the Meadows et al. So we'll do that on on Sunday as well. So when I talk to you then, and then, of course, Bean's back on Monday. So, uh, yeah, until that time, please, please have a wonderful weekend. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG, and them's the Beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for the Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Hi, I'm Harry Lichtman, host of Talking Feds a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Fed's favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond. Plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts. This spring, Transform your outdoor space into a regular gathering place for you and your loved ones with help from Ashley. Whether you're into wicker, teak, or driftwood-inspired furniture, we've got the look you're going for. Add in accessories like string lights and beverage tubs to take your patio party from basic to curated and enjoy cozy evening vibes with a new fire pit. Visit Ashley.com or stop by your local store and find affordable pricing and expert support today. Shop and save today, only at Ashley.